uh, writing anything that is potentially offensive or discriminatory content, then we will um, uh, remove people from the session on that. Okay, and uh, much more details, uh, you can email us at transportstrategy at leads.gov.uk and um, you know there's a lot more information out there on the website as well. And I, I'm here, Paul. Can you hear me? I can, Nigel. Yes, thank you. So I've done your housekeeping for you. Away you good. go. I was there and I was waiting to be let in. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panellists. Welcome to all of our audience uh, and, and participants. Uh, thank you, Paul, for going through um, the uh, housekeeping. Um, the, you'll be pleased to know he didn't mention it, but there's no fire alarm planned either. So um, you probably have to look after your own evacuation if we do hear one. Um, as Paul said, we're, we're going to be um, uh, recording this session. So um, we're hopefully you will come up with some interesting questions around what the future of mobility will look like. This is about new mobility solutions for Leeds as part of the um, Connecting Leeds uh, strategy. Uh, and we are fortunate to have with us um, three guest panelists who are going to give us five minutes on uh, various items associated with mobility in Leeds. Um, one, we've got Lindsay McGarvey, who's a principal transport planner at um, the City Council, and she's part of uh, the Influencing Travel Behaviour Team. Uh, and she's going to give us a uh, an overview of where we are with the transport strategy and what does the uh, big move around new mobility mean. Um, we're also have with us um, Greg Marsden, uh, professor of uh, at the Institute for Transport Studies in Leeds, and also one of the leading um, uh, principal investigator for Decarbonate, uh, which is about um, measures uh, and uh, research into how do we decarbonize, uh, decarbonize transport in the particularly in the UK. And then we've also got um, uh, uh, Richard Dilks, who's the chief exec executive at CoMU, MO, sorry, CoMO uh, UK. Um, uh, and then we've got with us, as you can see, Paul Foster, and I will be chairing a question and answer session at the end. So I think as we've only got an hour, I'd like to just go over to... Um, uh, Paul and Lindsay, who are going to give us a overview of the transport strategy and the new uh, new mobility solution for the big move, and um, what are we already doing in Leeds around new mobility solutions? So, Paul, over to you first. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Okay, so uh, as as Nigel says, I'm Paul Foster. I'm transport strategy manager at Leeds City Council, and um, we've been working on the transport strategy over the last year or so. And this was published uh, as a draft at December's executive board, with a vision of Leeds to be a city where you don't need a car, and that's about making sure that everyone has a healthy, affordable, low carbon choice for every journey they need to make, and. Um, that's really primarily focusing on looking at new modes. What, how can we change the way we way we travel? And the three drivers behind that are climate change, uh, delivering inclusive growth, and improving health and well-being. In terms of climate change, we really need to look to reduce the amount we travel, um, to change to more efficient modes, and then for those vehicles that are left in the in the fleet for essential journeys, for travelling uh, for goods, freight, etc., to make sure that they they are decarbonized and we look at the lowest form, uh, you know, and electricity, et cetera, for, for running those vehicles rather than the internal combustion engine. Um, in terms of inclusive growth, that's about making sure that um, everyone has access to the things they need in terms of transport to be able to access work, leisure and educational opportunities across the city. Um, to make an efficient system that um, saves time to both individuals and businesses and therefore benefits the economy and then working on how we can make everything more affordable and lower cost and therefore everybody's individual travel costs are reduced and that you know big impact to 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 everyone from from those benefits of the transport strategy that does that clearly in terms of improving health and well-being um you know the physical and mental health benefits of of travel can be uh, a, a hugely benefit 
um, the impact as well, reducing the impact of air quality, uh, you know, the air pollution at a local level, as well as the carbon looking at those pollutants and reducing that impact. And then also the impact of um, road safety on uh, individuals as well within the city. So they're the, the drivers behind the strategy. There's much more detail on that on the website and you can also look at the previous webinar that we did which really talked about the scale of the challenge so within that uh, we've set ourselves some very ambitious targets around uh, mode shift the council's commitment to make Leeds carbon neutral by 2030 to reduce that distance traveled and to to look at a vision zero approach to road safety okay then um Within the strategy, there are six big moves. And as I say, we're gonna do a webinar on each of those. And this one really is focusing on the new mobility solutions part of that. And, and that's very, you know, really important when you look back at that vision and how can we provide alternatives for every journey that people need to make. And this really is, I think, one of the most interesting and important aspects of that in terms of how we fill the gaps where public transport maybe doesn't work and you know people are very reliant on the private vehicles to do those journeys so I think really interesting um, and looking forward to hearing the views of the other panelists on how we can achieve that in Leeds then obviously you know Lindsay will go through what we're what we're already doing but this is very much about those those journeys that people need to make if you think about what you do what your family do in terms of accessing employment leisure health care whatever it may be we have a multitude of journeys that we all make at different frequencies and it's finding solutions for some of those obviously we already have a, a, a you know taxi and private hire fleet in the in the city that operate and fill a lot of those um those journeys for people who don't have access to a private car but we want to look at other alternatives and interested to hear what the other panelists have to say on that okay so i'll pass you over to lindsay who's going to go through some of the things that we're already doing in leeds and um and then see where we go from there thank you paul Thanks, Nigel, and, and thanks, Paul. Um, it, it's certainly a, a very exciting time in Leeds for transport. There, there's an awful lot going on. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of an introduction. My name is Lindsay. Um, I've been working at Leeds City Council for about a year and a half now. Um, I've been working in transport planning for about 20 years and I bring with me quite a considerable amount of experience from overseas. And I'm really keen to roll out some of those very successful schemes um, and, and learn from those that, that weren't as successful. Um, so we've, we've got some, some really good experience um, to, to help bring us, us those solutions. Um, so I'll, I'll talk you through some of the, the mobility solutions that we currently have in place um, and some of those that we are developing. And it's important just to remember that this is a flavour of some of the work that we are doing. Um, and it's just a, a small piece of the, that bigger jigsaw um, in terms of all the improvements that are going on in Leeds. Um, and, and remember too that it's not a, there's not one sole solution. There's lots of different solutions um, out there um, to suit different people and, and their different needs. Um, so I'll move on to car sharing firstly. Um, car club, it's sometimes referred to as car sharing. It's been around in Leeds for many years. It's a very well established and, and growing scheme and it's a terrific alternative to car ownership. Um, at the moment we've got around 70 vehicles um, for people to, to use um, and organisations to use and you can rent those um, from as little as an hour. Um, so they're really useful for short trips um, or allows you to have the, the convenience of access to a car without the need to, to own one. Um, many businesses use Car Club as an alternative to, to purchasing pool vehicles and, and really help reduce their costs as well. Um, so if you think about it, you might only use your car for say an hour or two every day. It sits out on the, the road for the rest of that time. And that seems to have reduced probably a lot um, during lockdown as well. So there's quite a substantial amount of costs involved in that car um, ownership, um, fuel, insurance, repayments, maintenance, um, but also the, the, the purchase price of your property if you need to purchase a, or, or live in a property that has um, parking as well so owning a car is a real investment and it doesn't quite suit everyone um, so the model that we've got in Leeds at the moment of, of car club is is back to base so you pick up the the car club vehicle and you drop it off at the, at the same location um, 
it's quite a, an inflexible system of, of car club. Um, it requires a traffic regulation order, which takes time and, and money to install. So it's it's not um, the, the, it's one of many options that, that we've got. Um, and what I'd now like to talk about is how we would like to move on from that single model of, of car club um, that we've got and, and talk about some of those other options that are out there. Um, if we can just move slide, please. Finn, thank you. Um, so we've spoken to, to lots of different operators about different models, um, and we'd like to be able to offer a mixture in the future. So that can include one-way car clubs, where you pick up a vehicle at one location and leave at a completely different destination. There's opportunities for airport-based schemes, peer-to-peer, um, -peer, where I can put my car on a platform and someone else can rent that out, and it's about the sharing economy as well. So um, it would also be useful to have lots of different operators um, within the district as well. That brings um, competition in terms of price. Um, some operators might want to locate to areas that other operators don't. So car club, car sharing, it's a really exciting space. Um, the Leeds e-cargo bike trial is something that we're just about to launch. Um, if we just move slide, thank you. Um, so we've got uh, four e-cargo bikes at the moment, two different models that we can lend out to um, businesses or organisations throughout the district um, to, to trial, just to get a bit of a flavour to see if uh, an e-cargo bike is the, the right investment for, for them. Um, so we can offer some training um, and advice about how to use it successfully. Um, so we've got quite a few organisations that are already interested and, and want to, to use them for inter-campus deliveries or other deliveries. Um, and they feel that it would be a cost effective alternative um, and probably quicker than deliveries by car or van. Uh, we've also got the um, Leeds Bike Hub, which opened in July. Um, it's temporarily closed at the moment. But that's given us a really good idea about what future bike hubs could look like. Um, so it started off in response to um, COVID. We expected to see a lot more people cycling into the city um, and we needed to, to address that demand for parking. But that developed into something a lot more um, of a richer offering. Um, we had uh, loan bikes. Um, we promoted our adult cycle training, had doctor bike lunchtime sessions um, and provided advice around journey planning. So again, we've learned a lot from that and we, we hope that with our second round of funding that we've received, we'll, we'll roll those out at a few more locations. And again, please let us know if this is something that we can bring to your particular area. Um, something that we've been pursuing for quite some time is a public bike hire scheme and, and we are still continuing ways to, to bring that to Leeds. Um, we've recently made an application for funding that would allow us to bring a, a fully docked um, and preferably electric scheme to, to Leeds. Um, so if we're successful in that tender, sorry, if we're successful in that bid, um, we hope to, to bring the tender process um, and have a, a launch round about um, winter this year. Um, so that's that. That's been a quite a journey, and, and hopefully we'll have some good news um, coming in the next month or two. Um, lastly, I'll just move on to the the e-scooter e trial. So in July last year. Um, we submitted a, a proposal to participate in the, the DFT um, e-scooter trial. Um, we wanted to have a really safe scheme. Again, bringing some of that learning from overseas. Um, we didn't want to have a dockless model and have scooters lying around the city. We opted for two um, quite different operating models, a long-term lease and a fully docked system. Um, and the key to that was to offer um, e-scooters to um, key workers and employees to, to help support their return to work during COVID. Um, unfortunately, um, there's quite a few legal issues um, around bringing that, that trial to Leeds, um, some technicalities around use of, of um, cycle infrastructure, and we know that that's been the case in some other jurisdictions as well. Um, but we still want to keep an eye on that um, and, and bring that to Leeds, um, if possible, at a later date and integrate that 
along with all these things that I've spoken about today um, into to hubs, mobility hubs, um, so that people have got access to a very wide range of transport um, and a, an alternative to, to car ownership um, or other public transport. Thanks, Nigel. That's great, Lindsay. That's a, a whistle stop tour through there. I think a couple, a couple of things that's uh, I think really important. You you've answered sort of some of the questions that have been emerging in the Q and A and the chat, or or given a, a starter to to answering those. I think the other thing that's really important about what you and Paul have said is that it's, this isn't just about people. You've been thinking about it in terms of. Uh, how goods are moved around the city as well. So uh, what, what I think is, is, is great is, is actually leads are, are doing things already, but they're already thinking about what, what happens next. So it n n uh, neatly moves us to Greg Marsden, who is just going to give us a flavour, and I think it can only be a flavour of the future of mobility. So uh, over to you, Greg. Yeah, thanks, Nigel. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a Professor of Transport uh, Governance, or sort of policy making issues, uh, up at the Institute for Transport Studies at the university. I am a member of the expert advisory panel for Leeds City Council. That's an unpaid position, and I'm not funded by any industrial uh, interests. Um, just click on to the next slide for me. Then. So, um, just asked to, to say a few things about uh, future of mobility, and I've tried to kind of insert what I'm saying in between what I think Richard will say and what I thought Lindsay would say. So um, one of the things that um, people talk about uh, with the future of transport is, you know, will we have driverless cars? You know, should Leeds be planning for a driverless uh, future? Um, so I think the Leeds strategy for 2030 takes a very pragmatic view of future technology. Um, so whilst there are trials in place of, of uh, driverless cars in places like Coventry, the reality remains that fully automated driving in complex city environments like Leeds is not coming soon. Um, and I think we also need to be quite wary of it when it does come. Uh, if we go down the route of uh, having individual ownership of uh, autonomous cars, all of the research suggests that's going to add more miles uh, to the to the miles we see on the road today as people send empty vehicles back home or off onto errands that they're not uh, taking part in. So um, I think for the future in general, planning for a shared mobility future is what's critical. And then if technologies come along which enable that to become more automated, then that can be built into the strategy. So I think going shared first, which is the plan, is the right way to go. Now, there may be some applications, um, so shared pods like the one at the bottom operating at, at niche sites like expo sites or, um, you know, large industrial uh, areas, or potentially, for example, connecting things like the bus and rail station, which in Leeds have got quite a bit of a distance between them. Those are the sorts of kind of specific applications of automation we might expect to see. There are lots of other things that you'll read about in newspapers. Uh, drones, uh, delivery robots, some of these things might um, scare you. Um, I think they're also a long way off. Um, there are trials of, of drones for moving medical equipment around between Southampton and the Isle of Wight, um, but there's so many issues around safety, noise, privacy. These are not things that are going to change what happens in the next decade uh, in Leeds. So I think that the strategy for Leeds there is to watch to engage with those technologies, understand them and build them into plans for the future that fit with what Leeds wants to be as a city, rather than just letting these technologies flood onto the streets when they are ready. Uh, okay, next slide, Finn. Um, one of the big moves is, is around um, sort of integration of, of transportation and future mobility. Um, and here I'm, I'm not talking about um, making sure that um, buses connect with each other, which is really important. But this is about thinking about all of these different technologies that, that Lindsay was talking about, all of these different options. If Leeds is going to be a place where you don't need to own a car, it's going to be a place that requires you to use lots of different services to make the journeys that you want to make. 
Um, so you can think about integrated mobility. M many of you will be familiar with the Oyster card in London, where you can tap on to, um, you know, the tube, the bus, um, certain rail services, um, and, and, and various kind of cross river uh, services. So, but in London, you, you can get around everywhere pretty much on public transport. And that's not the case in Leeds, and it's not going to be the case in Leeds, despite massive improvements that are planned for public transport there'll still be lots of journeys where that doesn't work so what this is really is a um a platform where which allows you to integrate these different services so you've got one way of accessing them now the example i've shown there is a, a system called wim which is working in uh, helsinki and lots of other places are looking at this kind of of technology um and essentially it's a bit like um I don't know, a mobile phone or a TV subscription, you decide what kinds of services you think you'll use regularly. And then it offers you uh, a set of discounts or, you know, you can ride free on public transport. Um, you can get access to uh, a higher car free at the weekends. Um, you can get a discount on taxis and you can get standard access to e-scooters, for example. Uh, and the question is, you know, what what would it take for that kind of system to be better or as good as having the car? And if you're not a car owner, how could this be better than public transport alone? What, what kind of offer would it need to be in Leeds in order for this to be attractive to you? So those are the questions that I think need to be, be answered. That they are um, plans within the Leeds strategy. And I think they're really, you know, this is where um, lots of different cities are going. Question is, how can we make this offer compelling in, in Leeds? So ne next slide, Finn. So one of the reasons why I think it could work in Leeds and why the, the strategy of trying to be a place where you don't need to own a car is on average, a car moves only 5% of the day. Even if you're a commuter, it's not actually moving uh, very much either stationary at home or stationary at, at work most of the time. We've done some work that shows that actually a third of all cars don't move at all on any given day. So you've paid for this vehicle and it's just sat on your drive or on the road and it's not doing anything. And the average cost of owning, insuring and maintaining a car, so this is new cars and old cars, including depreciation, the average cost just for having a car is £3,200 a year. So you're paying that money without even moving it. OK, so you could be using that money to access one of these mobility packages rather than buying access to this thing that actually doesn't get used all that much, however important it is when you do use it. OK, next slide, Finn, which is my last one, I think. So I think the question in Leeds is if we want to be a city where you don't need to own a car, what's the package of services that needs to exist in the different parts of the city? To make this work so i saw in the chat someone had said what about weatherby we haven't got um you know, haven't got car club cars there yet okay well let's engage with that question and say what does that package look like where suddenly weatherby becomes a place where it's actually a lot easier to get around without having a car whereas at the moment that appears to be quite a difficult choice so that's i think how different areas can can engage with this plan to try and think about how this all fits together um and that's a map of public transport in Leeds. There's lots of places that are a little bit away from a, a good public transport route. I think these new technologies, personal e-scooters or um, shared bike schemes or whatever, will allow us to make it easier to connect into these main public transport routes. And I'm almost certain that Richard will talk about mobility hubs as one, one way of doing that. So I'll leave my comments there and hand over to Richard, I think, Nigel. That's great. Thank you, Greg. Um, Richard, do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself as well? That would be, be really helpful. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, hello to everybody. Very good to be here. Um, I was born and brought up in Leeds, actually, by a, by a quirk, um, and uh, my parents still live there. So a subject close to my heart. Uh, and I actually remember um, my dad showing me um, an envelope he had uh, from the 70s. I'm just a child of the 70s but only by a few months um, and uh, he, he sort of remember him waving that at me when I was a, a kid in the 80s and uh, it, with the implication of 
uh, this, this hadn't been the right way to go. So it's very encouraging to see what's in the strategy and to hear the focus um, from Paul and Lindsay. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there are, there are significant opportunities um, for Leeds and significant needs as well. And it is Western Europe's largest city without uh, a, a, a metro train tube type or tram network. Um, so it's, uh, it's not surprising there's some issues to tackle. So next slide, please. And then I will just introduce uh, us for a uh, just a few moments here. Uh, we are Como UK, Collaborative Mobility UK. We're a collective body and a charity um, in the shared transport space We're for the public benefit of shared transport, uh, specifically actually the social, economic and environmental benefits of shared transport. And that is our, that is our mission. Been around uh, coming up 22 years now. Uh, and you can see there the sorts of work we undertake, uh, close working with authorities very much, including leads uh, and with operators is fundamental to how we work. Next slide, please. So just some, some brief highlight benefits on shared transport, why to, to bother with this at all, I'm very heartened by um, it being mentioned in all presentations um, so far. Uh, I shan't read those out. Um, I'll just make sort of bigger picture point here that um, I think it's, it's fair to say it's taken a while for shared transport to really get into the policy and, and debate and planning of authorities such as Leeds in the UK. Um, I do think that's turning around now uh, at scale, which is, you know, which is really welcome. Um, there are huge efficiency gains here, uh, there are virtuous cycles to be unlocked. Um, uh, you, can, you can see that um, in our research over the years, which finds that people who use shared options, use public transport and walk in cycling more than they did before. Uh, and that when they move from owning a car to sharing a car, they cut their mileage, uh, even you know, adjusting there for any lifestyle changes. It's not that they've, they've uh, cut the miles between them and things, uh, but you know, the, the shared car asks you a question, basically. Uh, it says to you, this journey is going to cost you this much, yes or no. Uh, and implied in that question is, do you want to make this journey in this way? And of course, a privately owned car uh, doesn't ask you that. Um, and for all that, very much agree with Greg's points about the, uh, uh, the cost of ownership there. There's a huge social and economic inclusion angle to all of shared transport. I don't think people perceive those costs very accurately or, or very, very often um, uh, just accepted. Next slide, please. Um, this is just touching on a sort of where we're coming from at a national level um, in the UK. Um, I think we should uh, underestimate the sort of message these, these figures give us, uh, the scale of the, the challenge slash opportunity we have ahead of us. Um, and when you stack these against the pathways we need to follow to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions for 2050 at the latest, uh, there is quite a lot needs to be done. Next slide, please. And that's to just give um, a sense of the opportunity with that, um, that scale figure of urban car journeys, um, but also uh, it, transport has become the, the, the problem sector here, actually. Uh, it is the largest single emitting sector now. Uh, it's absolutely not the case just a handful of years ago. Um, but it is now, uh, and emissions have gently risen up since 2012-13, not gone down at all. Next slide, please. So we've, we, we've covered um, uh, enough of that, I think, I'll just dwell briefly on one point about the interplay between bike share use and personal cycling. Um, so you can see that about half of our respondents in um, 2019 survey, and this is many thousands of people, uh, use a personal bike as well as using a bike share scheme. And the top percent go on to buy a bike. Um, it's also particularly good for engaging lapsed cyclists, this was on a, a previous slide. So you have a sort of a pass through flow that happens with a lot of people here coming backwards and forwards through the bike share scheme, going on to acquire their own bike, but still using the scheme or leaving the use of the scheme. And that's, you know, that's a win that someone hopefully converted to cycling and then someone else follows on behind them who is new to cycling and their bike share scheme is particularly good at getting at those people. Next slide, please. So a little quick sort of pen portrait of where we are. Um, most of this uh, has been covered. Um, 
uh, you know, we, we look forward very much to the time when more of these sort of modal gaps are plugged in leads. I hope that will be very soon. A um, bit of a torturous history on the bike share side um, and the shame that it's not one of the e-scooter trials, but hopefully that will turn around, perhaps with a, a phase two trial if DFT goes down that road um, or with legalisation of e-scooters in due course. Um, there are um, some closed loop schemes on the bike share side in Leeds with, uh, with the university and so on. Uh, and just to touch on that travel plan network there that, that Wicca runs, uh, which promotes uh, the, the lift sharing version of shared transport. Next slide, please. Um, just to give a sense of the trials, the e-scooter trials, uh, that's, that's, that's ripped off our website. Uh, so we'll end up, I think, with about 30 of these probably. Um, possible second wave, as I just implied, that's uncertain at the moment. So we may add to that number or we may not. Next slide, please. Just to touch on, um, on the integration of the sort of the parklet variety and the examples we're already seeing out on the streets of Britain. And then now go a little bit deeper into hubs because Great Crystal Ball was, uh, was working as so often. Uh, and I'll finish up there. So these are um, becoming more and more common. Um, various different ingredients can be put into it. Shared bike or e-scooter parking, you can see in the right hand image, uh, both uh, present there and uh, some seating, which can be, um, you know, along with food and drink or community seating, Wi-Fi hotspot, perhaps, ability to charge phones, perhaps, um, can take out car parking spaces, as in these examples, which is uh, then a double win. Next slide, please. And these can then scale up into grander things as per this, uh, this visual here. So uh, you'll see this is labeled a mobility hub. Um, that's, that's one shorthand term, it's the one we use um, with stakeholders. Um, by that, we mean somewhere where shared transport options, public transport, walking and cycling options, uh, community transport where relevant can all come together, can be cohered. Uh, now, the example in front of you there has got quite a lot of elements going on to it. You'll see pick up and drop off lockers, top left. Uh, you'll see EV charging, bottom centre. You see an e-cargo bike, bottom right. You'll see retail um, and, and public transport fully integrated. Um, you, you can have uh, that scale of things. And Leeds certainly has the scale to sustain some of those, I would argue, when you look across comparator uh, areas in Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Norway, the United States, where these are all widespread. But you can also be at a very um, small scale level. Next slide, please. So you can see there that, that we've identified a typology range there that does go from the small to the large and goes from the, you know, the rural through the peri-urban, suburban and into the urban. So this is not just a centre of Leeds story or a nothing beyond Headingley sort of story. Um, it, it actually could apply to, to very large swathes of Leeds, I think. And it, it's interesting in those parts of Leeds where um, density is lower, um, where journeys are often uh, orbital as well as radial, uh, and where public transport provision is, you know, is largely give it, geared around taking people into the centre of town, uh, which has an understandable logic to it, but uh, doesn't cater for all journeys by any means. Um, and uh, I think these hubs as a way to gather together options that are that are planned in a coherent way, potentially also to take away um, the, the less sustainable options such as private car parking at the same time, uh, have a real role to play. Next slide, please. So here you can see I'm just pulling out some of the uh, you know some of the examples here, and if I can move us on to, right to the next slide. Thank you. So we designed an accreditation scheme. We accredit operators in the bike share and car club spaces. Uh, and we now have accreditation of mobility hubs uh, that tries to put um, some concrete, uh, pardon the pun, detail into all these different elements. Uh, different lists here, depending on which type of hub we're talking about. Um, all this is on our website. I'm very happy to share links in the chat or afterwards, of course. Uh, and then next slide, please. We, we score hubs against those to uh, award uh, gold, silver or bronze for that type. Uh, and, and for a two year period, um, partly having in mind that, uh, that the world is moving fast uh, and ever more uncertainly, especially right now with, with uh, the pandemic, um, but also that maintenance of these places is critical and keeping them in good condition and, and looking attractive to people uh, is really important. Next slide, please. So, 
thank you very much for, for your attention. I think I've uh, probably more than used up my slot, in which case apologies, uh, but I hope that's useful and, and very much look forward to further debate. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Richard. I don't want to hang around. We've got lots of questions, so and um, we haven't got that much time left. So I'm going to go straight away to uh, Paul Foster and, and Lindsay, um, because there's been a number of questions and they have cropped up in, in other sessions that we've had. And that is, is this very city centre center centric? That's, uh, if that's a right alliteration. Um, and, and what are we doing? I think Greg's picked up on about up about it. Rich has picked up about it. What are we doing about provision outside of the city centre in other centres? Headingley's being mentioned, Weatherby's being mentioned, and what are we doing about orbital trips? So, Lindsay, Paul, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think it's probably some of the examples in terms of being able to get things that work commercially viable. The city centres are, are the the easiest opportunity for some of that because you have a high number of people who are not um if you who are there without their cars you know the, the the amount of public transport trips into the city center and so those and people who live in the city center those short journeys um you know the car ownership levels are very low there so so there's obviously a market in the city center which allows us you know when you're starting out with this you can trial things and and get them started up in the city center but it's absolutely imperative that this is spread citywide because actually it's the answer to those journeys that are not well served by public transport you know if you think about some of the journeys you make there's probably only maybe you three or four other people make that journey every day between those two destinations in the in the you know in the suburbs or in the in the towns uh, and the the rural areas around those market towns that we have in the city so actually the these solutions are you know purpose built if you like for that 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 those areas they've got to, we've got to look to deliver them in those areas and i think the challenge is to how can you know it's a bit chicken and egg we put them in and they will come or can you pump prime them to make sure that you know that they're there and then people start to use them or is there enough demand on day one to get them going and i think that's that's where we're at at the moment is looking at how we can get and i think there was a question in the chat wasn't there about you know the viability models of these things and we've got to understand how much does the uh the public uh purse back these schemes up versus how much of it is paid for by the individuals who use them and and is there a, a sliding scale where we start them off with a bit of support uh, help with the infrastructure to put them in and yet and then they become viable over time so that's the that's the challenge for us yeah. but certainly yeah, in terms of um, in terms of car club that that's why we need to look at those other models so the the traditional um, model that we have in Leeds as I explained the the back to base um, is, is quite cost heavy in terms of needing the the TRO um, but those other models like peer to peer where um, I put my car on the on a platform, um, and it's open for use at cost by anyone else. So there, there's there's no um, infrastructure required for that. Um, so those models, um, it, it's identifying the model um, for the location, um, and then also doing the marketing so that people know about it and, and they start to use it. And it, it, yeah, you have to change your mindset. At first, I, I wasn't keen on putting my car um, on a platform, but it works and I had that additional income. So um, yeah, the, the, there's lots of different things that we can do in different areas. It's certainly not um, all aimed at the city centre. That's really helpful. Thanks, Lindsay. I mean, one, one of the, 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 the questions that's come, come up quite, quite frequently in the Q&A is, is what are we doing about, about travel behaviour and travel choices? I mean, Greg, you, you touched upon that as part of your, your presentation. I mean, there's been quite a few questions around mass transit and why we don't have one. Uh, we have a panel uh, session on mass transit coming up. So I, I want to hold those questions for that. But how does future mobility choices that you've outlined, Greg, fit with more conventional uh, travel choices that we've got available to us today? Um, lot, lots of different ways, I suppose. I think that's um, that's one of the, the the big things that's that's changing. It used to be that you know you you would get a season ticket or a weekly ticket or a monthly ticket for a particular service, and and those providers would try and. Uh, lock you into that so you were either a captive bus user or a, a, a rail user or, or you would you would drive and actually doing a mixture of those things 
is is quite difficult it's not really economically sensible i think now the incentives are going to be much more uh, encouraging people who uh, often use something so you might use the bus two or three days a week uh, and you know you you'd be you'd still get a, a decent fare offering if you're a regular customer i think if you can tie that in with some of the things that um, you know richard was talking about mobility hubs i mean so i used to live out near moortown and there was loads of informal bus interchange that went on but there was no bike parking there there was no real places to wait it was freezing cold you know so there's loads of these little opportunities that could be made into much bigger opportunities if we're serious about it so you have to plan the whole thing though you can't just have like the odd one here or there because you know it's got to, it's got to work at all, at all ends of the journey so i think for a lot of reasons um you know the public transport operators need to come to the table because this is their this is their future as well they can't carry on plowing the model that they they always have done so we need a, a you know an ambitious civic partnership with the council with the operators and with these new mobility providers see if we can conjure up something that looks different to the car because um well we can't conjure up any solutions that allow us to carry on with car growth so we've got to do something different yeah i think i mean that goes to the heart of why why we we have a strategy being developed here in Leeds and also the uh, connectivity strategy that's been launched um, for consultation by West Yorkshire Combined Authority alongside their uh, their bus alliance discussion. So I, I think you're absolutely right. We, we do need to try and open up um, the approach. And, and, and Lindsay or, or Paul, are there plans for, for uh, it feels to me, you know, a mobility hub or, or looking at car clubs I think having a strategy that outlines where they might be in, in places outside of the city centre. Somebody's mentioned South Leeds. We've talked about Weatherby and Headingley and, and our other, other town centres, which make up, up the wider Leeds district. How, how, how are you going to bring those forward? So at the moment, we are looking at, at um, a site in uh, our potential for a site in Cross Gates. Um, and that is because we're linking that with one of the things that we didn't talk about maybe in this in this service was demand responsive transport, which is like uh, utilizing the shared minibus system that's based on public transport, based on the bus, minibus, it's sort of like cross between a minibus and Uber, um, but you know, so you're not using it alone for your own use, but it'll pick you up along the way, um, et cetera. So there's a trial of that going to happen uh, in East Leeds. So that's it. That's there. Um, and so that would be a, a destination for that in cross gates. You've also got a rail station there and then we could bring in the car clubs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one place where we're looking to prove the concept. Um, but, yeah, you know, you would think as we roll out across the city and this is a, you know, a 10 year strategy looking at all those major district centre, district and local centres are the places where these work because that's where people are likely to be travelling for other purposes as well and there's a you know there's a need to congregate in those areas as there always traditionally has been and so uh, having all those transport options at those places work. I think the other point that you know there's been asked in the chat about tram uh, or mass transit um, you know that's not going to do every journey and this is an important part of connecting you into that so if you live a kilometer away from a planned network you know using one of these options can get you to that point and then at the other end if there's also the option around those transit stops you know to pick up an e-scooter an e-bike or, or get on a demand responsive transport bus you know they're the they're the options you need to make those end-to-end -end journeys and that that last first first last mile is really important and this is where you know a lot of these solutions can play that part uh, for people so I think you know we absolutely agree that we need to develop a mass transit system in in West Yorkshire it takes time and it won't cater for every journey that you make and so these bits and are essential alongside that and because it's just delivering services on the network we already have we don't have to really build much we can deliver it much quicker okay thanks um I mean Paul Paul uh, you know the, the the transport conversation is about about making sure we reach out through these sessions and more widely uh, to get the views of other other people we, we really want to uh, reach uh, uh, as many people in the community and get their views that, that that's right isn't it yeah absolutely I, th I think i think you know we've had 
we're we're going around all the, the area committees the, the the consultations open we get those views across the city and you know there's you know people are, are telling us about their individual locations and the need for change in those areas and we understand that and that this strategy is for the whole city it's got to it's got to provide for everyone Okay, that's great. Uh, I mean, R Richard, can I get, come to you? Because you've obviously given us some great examples about, you know, where mobility hubs have been uh, being developed elsewhere. You, 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 you've highlighted a few of those. Um, you know, how, how can we bring those forward in a way that's meaningful for Leeds? You know, what role can they play? And I think also important within that, and a number of um, uh, participants have raised this, is how do we get the right integration through through ticketing or through payment mechanisms that allows us to, to, to genuinely knit together all these different forms of transport? Yes, thank you. I mean, I think that the questions in the chat box are brilliant, actually. I've been doing my best to answer them. Um, if we step back for a second, think um, how easy it is to use the private car, let's say in Leeds, um, and it is generally pretty easy, especially to go away from the centre. Um, and that doesn't take that long to do you know that's most of Leeds that isn't the center of course in terms of acreage um you know really we need to be matching that or beating it uh medium term at least onwards if we had to have a hope here um and so all this world of balkanized ticket products and disaggregated journey information and that's not what you face when you get in your private car at all, is it? Uh, you can just, you know, clamp your phone onto the dashboard or fire up the sat nav and away you go. It's all pretty simple. Um, so all those things are the absolute enemies of, of mode shift towards sustainable uh, transport for sure. I think the overlay with hubs and that question about ticketing, et cetera, is the physical hub uh, really, I think, should be thought about as part of it. And it has a sort of digital twin, if you like, which is the, the, the mobility as a service type app, Greg mentioned WIM, etc. cetera. Um, I think this is where authorities can take these two uh, things down, down parallel tracks at the same time. Um, uh, and that way you are then scooping in uh, a much wider potential audience. You have lots of interesting routes to try and message them, communicate with them, promote and incentivize these options as well as disincentivizing private car use. Um, and, and that's all stuff that's pretty much job undone at the moment. There's, there's nowhere in the UK that's really doing that at scale. There are some trials and pilots. Uh, there aren't so many places globally that are doing all of that. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much here, uh, but we've got to, as I say, match that convenience of the private car. How hubs will, you know, will get going? I mean, the chat box here has got part of the answers, people immediately identifying cycle rail, uh, park and ride sites, existing parking for bikes. And it, it, indeed, those are, you know, sort of low hanging fruit. Um, plenty of work going on in various areas of the country to look across areas and study where feasibility looks highest for different types of hubs. This is an emerging art and science, but it is going on right now. We're involved in a few of those projects. Um, I think some of these could, you know, could well do with thinking about. The lessons learned from those other countries you mentioned, you, uh, you know, I touched on before, I think are um, start small, start quick, be flexible, be okay with failing on some of them, learn quickly uh, and keep going. Uh, and over time build out. Um, uh, and, you know, Brayman started in 2003 uh, and is, is going strong. Uh, I, I forget how many hubs they're on to now, but it's, you know, it's well in the hundreds. Uh, so, it's, you know, it's, it's a proven concept. E each one is different. Uh, we are just doing some work that will finish in a couple of months' time about the business models behind them. We're going to get different versions of this in the UK. We're going to get in a wholly public sector funded and owned operated ones potentially even uh, we're going to get wholly private sector funded and owned operated ones and we're going to get ones that are, is some sort of hybrid of those two uh, all those routes are totally valid they all carry their own opportunities and risks so we're doing a bit of work now that will be out in public domain and hopefully help people shortcut a bit of the thinking uh, it takes some of the burden off authorities like Leeds or Wicker and so on and um, and speed things up a bit. That's great. Uh, that's great, Richard. And just a follow up question. I mean, that's cropped up in a few of the um, participants questions, and that is um, legislation. Do we need what, you know, what legislation are we going to need? Should we be 
thinking about that sooner rather than later? Um, if I just come in on that, so I mean, I think that just the real world big answer here is DFT is, is uh, looking at a potential future of transport bill, uh, which would be next year, you know, asterisk, <laughs> check, check against delivery. It's not exactly an easy time to be getting stuff through Parliament, etc. obviously, and this is not a, a, a done deal at all as we talk here today. That strikes me as the real world opportunity, um, you know, to think about what should be in that, what could be in that, uh, and not just in on the face of the bill and in the black and white text itself, but in the guidance around it and in its relationship with existing secretary legislation. Those would be the routes by which things can be kept up to date, uh, you know, which is so important here. We, you know, question in the chat box uh, about electric skateboards. Well, five years ago, if we were having this event, I don't think we'd have had a question about electric skateboards. So you, you can't nail all that stuff down in one piece of legislation and then wait 30 years to update it. You, you've got to have some, some routes to, to keep it fresh, etc. But that strikes me as the, the sort of real world opportunity, um, albeit uh, because we don't get transport bills very often in, in this country, uh, albeit it'll only cover so much. So it's not like, I'm not saying at all, we just need to have a beautifully presented case for that bill and I can sort everything out far from it. You know, most things have to be tackled here and now and on the ground. That's great, Richard, thank you. And, and Lindsay, can I ask you, you know, is this something that you're thinking about from a Leeds perspective? What 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 is it we need? Can we use existing powers or, or are we really dependent on some new legislation? I think we need some new legislation, Nigel, um, and certainly that's one of the barriers that we came across with the, the e-scooter trial. Um, it was around the definition of the, the e-scooter itself, which was classed as a vehicle. Um, so that's one small piece of um, legislation that very much made us ineligible for the trial um, because you can't use a vehicle on cycle tracks. Um, so uh, that, that's something that, that we need to address or, or DFT needs to address. Um, I also saw in the, the comments some questions around um, people that park over cycleways and um, block access. So again, um, you know, do we, do we need to look at the, the powers that some of the civil enforcement officers have in London boroughs that they don't have in, in other jurisdictions um, to allow enforcement um, or to, to allow different types of enforcement as well so for example cameras um so uh, yeah opening a can of worms there but there's certainly lots of different um methods to to help us that, that need to be addressed in that that bill um and, and also simplifying the system too. So being able to be a lot more reactive rather than having to um, go through um, traffic regulation orders, that kind of stuff. So just to really simplify the system um, and, and use existing technology that's out there. And again, lots of the Oyster card questions that are coming up there. Um, we've got the M cards and there should be the ability to um, use that for, for all modes of transport. It's It's the, the combined authority need to address that really quickly. So yeah, lots of changes required. Yeah, uh, I mean, Lindsay, that's a great, a great answer. And I think the point you've made, which stands out very strongly for me, is that you you've got a very agile and and flexible set of systems coming forward. You know, some some challenges with that, as as Richard's pointed out and Greg's pointed out. Uh, but you need some agility about how you deal with this as well. So I think, you know, we, we have to think about how we can bring bring forward that agility. That's that's really helpful. I mean, Greg, can I just go to you about, because there's a number of questions around choice in here. I know you've done a huge amount of work around travel demand uh, and around choices. How do we get uh, a more informed set of choices? I mean, technology seems to have a role to play. Price has got a role to play. How do we get people to make choices that are that are the best ones for them, uh, and 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 but actually solve some of our mobility and and transport challenges. Uh, good question, Nigel. Um, I'm probably not going to give you a very techy answer on that. I think actually it's about the whole system approach. So at the moment, it's quite difficult to have um, a really meaningful conversation with people in Leeds about making more sustainable choices when there are just so many you know, parts of the network that aren't 
um, you know, properly filled for cycling, for example, where we still got problems with, you know, the, the cost of bus operations or the reliability in particular legs. You know, it's part of this whole package. I think people need to see by the actions that the council's taking, which I think they are, you know, like this route, we're going to hand over this space to cycling and this space to public transport. This is what it's going to mean to, to travel around in Leeds. Then I think you can, you can take more people with you on that journey. I think otherwise you, you just, you, you can run into a, a wall of skepticism. But the one thing I do like about the, the approach we've got now, and, you know, people have been putting this in the, in the chat, the use of the commonplace platform is unlocking so if anyone hasn't been on and, and seen this is that it's a website where you can say what kinds of services you want they recently have launched something about where, where would you like a car club car these are new ways of engaging with with the council and with providers that they had no idea you know where where next to put the service so you can you know you can actively engage and start to shape the provision that's put there for you rather than waiting to see what the council gives you and whether that fits your choices you know you can now more actively engage so i think that's a a positive development but i think it's going to you know you can you, you just can't fix this overnight giving people an app uh, which tells them what what the current quality and price of services is is not going to lead to the kind of outcomes that we want from the transport strategy it's all going to have to come together over you know, over a period of a few years, I think. That's a, I think that's a really good answer. I think this this whole integration point is absolutely critical uh, to so much of what we do around transport, and it's a bit of a, a, a holy grail. Um, I'm, I'm just going to we're going to need to wrap up shortly, but I just want to go around the panelists and sort of say if there's one thing you could do to help achieve some of the objectives that have been set for um the city in the q a and, and in the transport strategy uh, and you had a choice to do one thing what would be the first thing you'd try and try and do if i can go to you paul uh you know as the lead for the transport strategy if you had some choices now available to you which one would you pick so i think i just want to before maybe my my, my my pick there's a few questions isn't there about once you've got these services, especially in terms of cycling, e-scooter, et cetera, you've got to have a safe environment to ride them in. Yeah. And so there's a lot of work we're doing, and we'll talk about that in one of the other sessions about you know, building up that cycling network, uh, the safe streets, the communities where walking and cycling become uh, second nature and, and easy for people. So actually there's a, there's a thing we've got to build to support the rest of this. But for me, it is about having some, uh, revenue support some funding to make these types of measures happen to get this shared mobility solutions out there on a scale that are, are available to everyone in the city across the across the different areas and that for me would be will is the point where you get a game changer if we can change that car ownership model so that people who own own two cars only own one for people who own one and don't use it very often they can actually have got a viable alternative to do that that's the change that's necessary to get us uh, a long way down the line in this that's a yeah that's a good answer paul and i i i think you know your point about making sure that the city as a whole not just the city center is is um, accessible by all of our people uh who Need to need to move around the city is really important. It's a big in question that we covered in the previous session and also came up today. You know that people with disabilities or people who have got impaired mobility for any reason or visual impairments, is it going to be safe for them? And I know that you and the team at Leeds who are doing the connecting Leeds work, you know, put a very very high priority that this needs to be a city that's a you know where mobility is for everyone. So that, I think that's that's really good, Richard. Um, really difficult question I've I've asked you, but if you had to pick something, what would it be? Well, possibly predictably, I'm going to cheat slightly and try and weave in a couple to what with a thin veneer of this is only one thing honest across the top of it. Um, I, so my thing is uh, that you know, and I lead. I think Leeds Authority is is going down this track, but it, it should 
look right across all the shared transport options and it should avail itself of as many of those as it can, which will mean different things for each one of them. It should have a strategy about this and it should stick at it. Um, and that I think will, it's not magic, it won't be the only solution, of course. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't need very good public transport, you absolutely do. Uh, but I do think it's, uh, you know, it's really, really important. And I think Leeds is a bit behind on this uh, at the moment. The UK itself has, has actually proportionally fallen back on where it was on shared transport. Uh, if you look back sort of 10 years ago, certainly in some places, uh, although it's, it's, it's powering up now, we're at an all time high in terms of the number of schemes and users, even with the pandemic. So I think there's a lot to be seized on there. And I would think about the infrastructure side of that, the work Paul was just talking about with cycle lanes and, and, and so on, mobility hubs in the future, hopefully that all fits together as a, as a lattice work. And if I might just cheat a bit more and, and just talk about the Metro point, you know, cause I've, I've watched the tram, super tram, trolley bus, super trolley bus, and it's, uh, you know, uh, debates come and go. Um, it's not to say that it, such massive investments in public transport wouldn't be super welcome, of course they would. Um, but knowing Leeds a bit as I do, uh, and now living in suburban London as I do, it, it is amazing how good a public transport network needs to be to get people out of their cars. Uh, I'm sitting here, I'm less than six miles from the Thames in the supposedly relatively dense suburb, Everybody's got a car or two cars, quite frankly, on the street. You can just see over my shoulder here. Uh, and with lockdown, it's the cars that they're using. Uh, of course, public transport's got sort of locked out, which is quite a worrying future trend there. So in other words, fixed route public transport, really important, but it absolutely won't address all the challenges Leeds faces. And that's what we're going to pick up in the mass transit session, which is planned for early March. So I think that's going to be uh, an important one for, for anybody who wants to, to join in. So, Lindsay, all the pressure's on you, sounds like. <laughs> I think I might go a bit more light-hearted, but um, yeah, maybe, well, perhaps maybe we all need to, but before we can um, sit your driving test, uh, you, you need to um, be able to, to cycle or, or, or ride a bike for a year before you can you can apply to sit your test. So um, perhaps that might be the way to, to do it and get people on their bike before they get in their car. Um, another just quick point might be that we need to start using the canal or, or our river systems a lot more as well. Um, some really lovely opportunities there for us. So that would be my, my point. That's great. Thanks, Lindsay. Well, I, I'd like to thank all, all, all the panellists because it's been a, a real challenge, um, you know, to try and uh, second guess what the future of mobility might look like, uh, although none of you have come up with anything, uh, you know, too fantastic in terms of your thinking, because it's all there and, and available to us today. It's um, a lot of it's about, is it affordable? Does it, is it convenient? Does it do what we, we want, want, want it to do? And does it have the convenience of the car? Is it integrated? You know, have we got any single choices? No wonder it's quite a complex area. And I think we've got some, some big challenges about knitting it together. And that's why I'm sort of really pleased, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a strategy, but um, Greg, Greg, I'm just going to give you as a, as a, as a panelist and, uh, and also as part of the advisory panel, you know, you, you've always pressed hard for us to have a strategy and, and, and to be ambitious about it. You know, are we heading in the right direction? Um, you know, do we need to move quicker? Uh, do we need to be more ambitious? Um, I think resources will be a big constraint on how much can be done, which is why I'm so keen that we actually have a clear strategy about what we want to do, because I think that is going to help us unlock uh, that funding. Um, and I, I think, you know, from from what people have been saying, I also think it's time for Leeds to kind of um, lead and ask for stuff from the Department for Transport. You know, I think that post COVID, we, we can make demands of the bus operators to play uh, how we want them to play in our in our integrated fare system that, you know, they've received huge amounts of subsidy to keep the services running. Um, and they're going to need to continue to receive that as you know, social distancing is going to be a reality for some time to come. So what are the terms and conditions that we want uh, in Leeds for the years to come? Let's get them set now and, and reboot a new new relationship that, that fits with the strategy and, and fits with the needs of the people. And there's plenty of uh, examples of what those needs are that have, that have come through the chat. That, that, that's great, Greg. Thank you for that. So thanks to all the panellists. 
more importantly, thanks to all the participants. Where I think we got up to sixty plus uh, uh, at one time. There's some great questions. Just to give um, some confidence to all those people who submitted questions and took the time to do that, we will be trying to respond to those in various ways. We will be recording them because there's some really valuable um, points that people have been making in there. So we want to capture those. Um, there's further information available on the Connecting Leads website, or if you've got further questions you want to raise, then you can do that through um, the team at Transport Strategy, transport.strategy at leads.gov.uk. Um, and Finn's just very kindly put up some of the forthcoming webinars that we've got dates for. Uh, so you can see the next one is transforming the city centre. Um, uh, and I think that's going to have some interesting questions about what about outside of the city centre based on, on today's questions. Um, and then we've got one following on decarbonising transport, which I think you're involved in, Greg, aren't you, to your role in, in decarbonate. So um, we really want to get all of your views. We welcome the questions. We like them to be challenging. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, thanks for making the time uh, available today to join in. Um, thank you very much from everyone and hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.